thousand people in Venezuela have been served over the last five years here um, through the boxes of blessing ministry at New Providence. Uh, I want to bring up um, Miss Raquel and Mr. Wally. Come on up here, guys. Um, and uh, yeah, come on. Yeah, bring the fam. Sure, absolutely. Um, this is this has been a ministry uh, amazing, amazing over the last five years here. And um, I just wanted to, to give an opportunity um, for, uh, for them to share just a couple of words here. Because here's, here's what's happened. About five years ago, New Providence um, became, uh, had, a, had a covenant, right? Six years ago, five years ago, something like that. Um, and uh, just agree, it had, this, had this covenant agreement. And uh, just amazing. I want to hear from your guys' heart just this morning as we celebrate this. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, yeah. Hi, I'm Raquel uh, from Venezuela. And I want to start with this. Then... Uh, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And I'm so grateful for these five uh, last years that uh, New Providence Baptist Church, our family church here, uh, have served uh, so many people in Venezuela during very hard times, uh, a lot of broken people, and even from the distance, you have been uh, hugging them, feeding them. I'm sorry, I'm still learning English. And uh, uh, loving them. So loving action, amor en acción, was real because uh, all of you and the effort of the church. Uh, we came here to this country in 2017 in two years before my, my dad and I uh, were praying for a ministry to feed people, not just for their body, but for their soul as well. So more than 50,000 people uh, receive food for their bodies, for their souls, and just in the gospel. And more than 70 families are uh, in this, the first year uh, were very active in the church just because this new ministry that started there. And it was, uh, well, my two dads, Mark and Israel, are now in heaven celebrating this day as well and all the effort from the church. So we are grateful and thankful and we love you very, very, very much. The pastor of the church sent me a letter, but it was super long. So I will translate it later and send it to the pastor to have it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You want to say anything at all? No? That was, that was good, right? I want the church to give a round of applause to the Lord, what the Lord did. Absolutely. So, so thankful. So thankful. I want to, um, I want to pray over us just right now, if that's okay. Can I do that? Even if it's not okay, I'm going to do that, okay? Let me, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, not just for um, the Alvarez family, not just for the people um, of Venezuela and the people here at New Providence and the connection that you made, God. No one else could make this connection the way you did. No one else saw these parts all coming together the way you did. Father, as we just saw the statistics, I shared with another church much larger with, than this one that this church has gone into a covenant agreement for five years to send food every month, thousands of pounds of food. And, and a larger church said, that's just not possible. But with you, God, all things are possible. Thank you for this church family that has said, we believe in, a, in an impossible kind of God, a God that can do the impossible. Father, as we just saw, thousands upon thousands of people received food but more important than anything, as Raquel just said, thousands and thousands of people heard the gospel message because of the faithfulness of your people and the goodness of you. I pray, God, that you would continue to do a great work in Venezuela. I pray you would continue to do a great work here. God, as this covenant has now completed, I pray, Lord, that we don't just stop here, that we find where you're working now and we join you there. We find the story that you are writing and the connections that you are making, Lord, so that we can be faithful to you. Lord, this is a hard day for me. This is a hard day for Raquel. 
this is a hard day for each of our families seeing something that the patriarchs of our families you used in such a powerful way. Lord, but we know that as you continue, as the church continues, your work does not stop. So we pray that we would join you in your work today. Wherever it is that you are working, let us join you there. Give us clarity and give us vision. Give us passion as we run forward where you are leading us. We give you great praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. I appreciate everything that, that has happened to this church. Give the Lord a round of applause again. He's so good. Uh, we, we see that um, over the last few years, again, the, the partnership with the Boxes of Blessings uh, it was a beautiful partnership. We are thankful to the Lord that he did such a great and mighty work. Uh, some people have asked, are we still giving, uh, uh, the, are we still doing the boxes of blessings? Um, and uh, it's, it's become increasingly difficult um, after it was, it was so crazy. It was almost as if God knew what he was doing. And he said that he wanted to put us into this partnership for five years. And then at the end of the five years, a couple of months ago, uh, it, it just got very difficult for us. It seemed like stuff wasn't lining up. And it was almost like God said, I told you five years. And now, I'm not done working. So, seek me, search me with all your heart, and let's see where I'm working now. And so it's always difficult to close up a ministry, but we do know this. Our association office is still sending food to another area there in Venezuela. If, you still, if that's still a burden on your heart, I encourage you to connect with our association and do that. Uh, we believe God is always at work and uh, there, are, there are so many needs around the world, but the good news is the church gave this world, uh, the God gave this world the church, and we are there to, um, to, to follow after him with all of our hearts and to see people come to know him as, our, as their savior. That's our heart, that's our goal, that's what we want to see as a church family. I am thankful, thankful, thankful. And it's kind of funny how all this has played out because uh, I've been meeting with Raquel for a little while with some of the staff members. We've been praying about this and, you know, what, do, what does the Lord want us to do? And um, it, it's, it's awesome to see this has been going on for five years. I haven't been here in five years, right? I've been gone for, uh, I, was, I served on staff here years and years and years ago. Ten years ago I left, um, or 11 years ago now. And, but over the last five years, I, I realized that I've, I've, I was a part of this ministry too. My kids were, were still a part of it and it was still a part of our family and praying for it and, and donating to it and seeing God do a work because here's the deal, I, I really do believe in this God that can do the impossible. Like I just believe that I, and people think I'm crazy for it and that's okay, think I'm crazy. I'm the, one that's good, I'm the one that's seeing all the blessings. It's amazing to watch God do what only he can do and I'm so thankful to be a part of something that God is up to. Today we are in our third week of our Good News series. And today I've got, a, this is a good one for you, okay? So tune in, pay attention, because this one is solid. I looked all through scripture to make sure I was just talking about the scripture today, and I am, so that means it's going to be really good. So here's where we are in Luke chapter number 6 today. Luke chapter 6, specifically verses 6 through 11. Now this, uh, we're going to look in Jesus' ministry. A couple weeks ago we talked about how the Old Testament pointed to a Messiah that was coming. Last week we talked about the baptism of Jesus when the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were in the same place in the same moment, right there in the same instant, and Jesus' ministry began, and how his ministry began, and he went out into the wilderness after the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God was on him, went out into the wilderness, began his earthly ministry. Today we're going to see, he's, he's in year two now, okay, Jesus' earthly ministry lasted three years. This was in the second year year of his ministry so he's already had a little bit of buzz about him in fact this miracle that we're talking about today in Luke chapter 6 is also mentioned in Mark chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 12 and so this is a, a scene that several of the disciples witnessed and they wrote down because it was a big deal <laughs> he's like well something's happening in the account in the book of Mark it gives us a little bit more insight. A couple of weeks earlier from this, Jesus had gone into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now, this is taking place on the Sabbath. So, I want to read uh, Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse number 6 today. The Bible says, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. So, before we go too much further, I'll just explain a couple things about the Sabbath. 
The Sabbath, the Jews, God instituted the Sabbath for the Jews to observe the rest that only God can give. Okay, that's what the Sabbath was there for. And good practicing Jews would show up to the synagogue on the Sabbath. So it was a gathering. Synagogue means gathering, bringing together of people. It's kind of like our worship gathering, right? Now, it's not the same thing, but it's very similar. It's the people that are gathered together for one purpose, and that's to observe and honor the God who called them, okay? So that's the purpose of the Sabbath and the synagogue specifically, the bringing together people. So here we were on another Sabbath, as it says in the book of Luke. A couple of weeks before this, Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, And there was a man there with an unclean spirit, so a demonically possessed man. Jesus calls out the demon, sends him away, and everybody everybody praises Jesus. And his fame begins to spread. That's what happened just a couple of weeks before this. So Jesus, kind of his following really grew in in a big way, in a fast way, very quickly, whenever he cast a demon out of a guy. Then a couple of weeks later, we know that there's a few other things that happen on some Sabbaths in between. Again, this is the second year of his ministry. And now he's entered the synagogue again on the Sabbath again. And here's what happens this time. It says, uh, actually before I jump into that, I want want to give you a couple of other things on the Sabbath here. Jesus, this is for you Bible nerds, okay? I'm a Bible nerd. I love the Bible. I love the scripture. Jesus performed seven miracles specifically recorded on the Sabbath. He recorded seven. Now, if you are a Bible nerd, you know that biblical numbers mean something. You know that the numerologies about the scriptures have a a deeper meaning the more we dig into it. The number seven is the number of completion. It means it's complete. It's, it's not the, the, the perfect number is three, and then you've got the number of completion, which is seven, right? The creation of the world, once it was completed, was the seventh day. Every time you see the number seven in the scripture, it typically points us to this has been completed. Jesus is the Sabbath, right? He is the Sabbath. So he is completing the Sabbath by showing that he is the true Messiah, and this is now complete. He's, he's, he's got seven miracles that he performed on the Sabbath. Three of them are very specific, and I want to share those in just a minute, but I wanted you to see this is a Sabbath day miracle. The the religious leader's not happy about it. Listen to what happens. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so they might find a reason to accuse him. So these first couple of verses, we're getting the picture. Jesus shows up to the synagogue on the day of rest. Sabbath meant rest. You can find your rest in God and him alone. So there were all these rules and restrictions for the Sabbath. Specifically, the Pharisees were known to tell you all of the rules on the Sabbath. So here's what happened, right? You got God who said, rest, that's your Sabbath. So then the Pharisees, all of the scribes, the lawmakers, those people said, well, what does rest mean? Well, I know that this is work picking this up, but if it was only half full, it wouldn't be considered work. That's what, that's what, that's what happens when people get involved, right? It's like, okay, this is confusing now. I don't know how much what's work and what's not work. As you've heard it said, I'm sure you could carry half of an orange, but you couldn't carry a whole orange. Like, that's a real thing. Like, what in the world? Somebody is thinking, well, if you carry a whole orange, that's just work. I'm like, what about a whole Reese cup, right? That's my question. That's my, do you have to just separate the the package, right, and just take one at a time, or can you carry both in your hand? That's my, more my question, more my speed. But as the, as the religious leaders got involved, they said, here's all the specific rules that you have to follow in order to stay in line with what rest means. So Jesus is there. Basically, here's what the religious leaders were trying to teach people. You need to not work on the Sabbath. You don't need to strain yourself. 
I'm here to tell you Jesus can heal without straining himself, okay? I just want you to know that before we jump into this story. Spoiler alert, something's about to happen. And the, the, the Pharisees think, oh, he's working. And God's like, Jesus is like, that wasn't work at all. <laughs> what are you talking about? I just healed the guy. No big deal for me. Here's what happens. So it was on this episode. The, the religious leaders are there. They're watching him to see if they can find a reason to accuse him. That's what they're doing. So these religious leaders, and, and so first I want you to see just like the people that are here at, at the church service, right? So the people that are here on the church service are Jesus, who's full of compassion, this man with this crippled disease, and he's, he's there just being faithful. Listen, he's just a faithful person. He's just showing up because he's supposed to show up. He's not asking for anything. He's not, walk, it doesn't, he's not walking around asking for money. He's just there. And then you've got the religious people who are there to criticize. So you've got people there ready to learn, and you've got people there ready to criticize. I hope that's not a picture of the church today. I don't know what you came in here for. Maybe you wanted to criticize this new preacher that's been here for a couple of months now, 83 days. Maybe you wanted to criticize him. If that's the case, listen, then come tell me to my face, don't bring that mess in the church. Don't bring it into the worship service. Do you realize every single, by the way, every single miracle, every, well, let me, let me keep going. I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, goodness, this is about to get really good. But he knew Jesus, but he knew their thoughts, the thoughts of those who were there to criticize him, right? He knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And the man rose, and he stood there. So here's what Jesus does. He stops the teaching. And he sees, he hears the hearts of those critics in the room. Those that were looking to accuse him. And Jesus, knowing what he knows, says, okay, we're going to call this up front and center. So he calls the man with the withered right hand to come and stand in the middle of all of them. So he brings him up as Jesus, and you got to think, these Pharisees, they're like, Oh, he's doing it. He's about to do it. Here he goes. Look at this. Oh, we, we knew he was going to, oh, we just saw, we saw the guy with the, with, the, with the messed up hand. We knew he had a messed up hand. We, we knew he was going to be at church today. I didn't know. I mean, Jesus is right here. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna heal this guy right in front of everybody. He's going to do it. And Jesus is like, oh, yeah, and I want to make sure you don't miss it. So Jesus brings the man up in the front center, stand right here. The man just faithfully walks up, stands right there. And Jesus said to them, he doesn't even talk to the guy that's standing here, right? Jesus says to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so and it was restored. This is Jesus right here in this moment. He says to all of those people there to judge him and there to cast this curse on him and there to take him down to destroy him to in, to take away all of his ministry here's what they say to Jesus how dare him he says I'm going to bring this man up here and I'm going to give you the explanation meaning this I'm going to shine the light on what the Sabbath is here for I'm going to make sure you understand because you've obviously learned something that was not correct. You've learned that you've got to follow these paths so that you can make God happy. And I'm telling you that the Sabbath is here because God is the only way you can find true restoration, true peace. He says Sabbath is here to restore you. We rest from work so we can be restored so we can go work. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. And so Jesus is saying it's good that this man is restored. That's the true meaning of the Sabbath. So he's got a withered hand. He can't work. It's his right hand, which is the dominant hand in this culture. Typically means it was hard for him to have a job. It was hard for him to go and do any type of labor. And so here's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to bring this guy. Do you realize the guy didn't even ask for it? The guy didn't even ask for it. You know, as I was looking through scripture, Jesus healed three times in the synagogue. Inside the synagogue, he had three miracles. He healed this man. He healed uh, the, a lady that was crippled, right? She was bent over crippled. And he healed another guy with what's called dropsy, which is another physical ailment. All three of those, they didn't ask for it. Do you know that every synagogue miracle... They did not ask for it. Here's what that means to me. 
nobody showed up to the synagogue expecting a miracle. Nobody showed up to the synagogue expecting a miracle. They either showed up to learn or to criticize. That was it. Nobody showed up for a miracle. And do you know that those three people that he healed with the physical infirmities, there's only one other place he healed a guy that did not ask for it. Only one other place. Do you remember the scene we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks where Peter cuts off Malchus's ear, right? In the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they come to arrest Jesus, he cuts off Malchus's ear. Malchus didn't ask for it to be healed. Jesus picks it up, puts it back on his head. Do you realize, I'm getting chills because I know what I'm about to say. Uh, do you realize that when nobody asked for a miracle, every instance was something to do with the body parts not working. So Jesus sees and notices there's a body part not working, so he has compassion, his heart is drawn to it, and he says, I want the whole body functioning together as one. That's where Jesus' heart is. I believe that he looks at the body of Christ, the church today, and he says, I will perform a miracle so the body works together. That's where no one that had these issues had asked Jesus for anything. They didn't go to Jesus and say, hey, Malchus didn't say, hey, my ear fell off, can you fix this? The man with the withered hand didn't go in and say, hey, Jesus, I know you can perform a miracle. He's just there faithful showing up. He's just going through life the best he can. The woman that was crippled, that was, she was bent over and it was hard for her to walk. She didn't go into the, to the synagogue saying, can you heal me? She just went in to be the faithful person doing the faithful things. Whenever the man with dropsy was in there, who had, and it was fluid built up all in the body in different places. And when Jesus healed it, there was nobody that asked. Those guys didn't ask for a miracle. Jesus was saying this to us. I want the whole body working together. I want the whole body functioning the way the body needs to function. I don't believe Jesus has changed, by the way. I believe that Jesus wants the body of Christ to be working and functioning the way it should be. That's what I believe, and I see it throughout the Scripture. These people didn't even ask for it. But Jesus' heart is drawn so that the body can work together. When he does this, when he does this in this moment, he restores this man We see this scene. He says, I say to you, this is it lawful to heal or to destroy, right? And then he tells the man, he says, stretch out your hand. Jesus didn't touch it. He didn't bring it out. He didn't do some kind of wave thing over it. It was his word. It wasn't his work. Jesus didn't work to restore this man. He just said it. That's all Jesus has to do. And I can't help but wonder, whenever we gather together, Are we gathered together because of the work Jesus is doing or are we gathering together because of the word of Jesus? Are we gathering together? Is the word enough for us? Is the word enough for us to come and gather together? Take away the building. Take away the nice comfortable seats. Take away the air conditioning. Take away whatever it is that you want. Take away all the the extras. Is the word of God enough for us? It's enough, understand, to restore. It's enough to heal It's enough to take brokenness and restore it into wholeness. That's enough. That's what Jesus does. As he is here in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he says, I have performed these miracles on the Sabbath before. I'm performing this miracle right now in this moment. And what happens? Depending on who you are in the room. Earlier, whenever Jesus heals the man with the, uh, when he cleanses, casts out the demon in the man on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, whenever he does that, there is a moment where everybody begins to rejoice and praise God, saying, oh my goodness, this guy not only teaches with authority, he speaks with authority, and when he speaks, stuff happens. When he speaks, stuff goes on. This is a different guy. And then he gains this big following. And now he heals this man of this this withered hand. He says, this body's not working right, so I want to make sure that we make the body work right together. We see what happens next. And as we look at this, listen to what it says next. It says, uh, um, and at, the, at looking around, he said to the man, stretch your arm, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was fully restored. But they, verse 11, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Do you hear what the critics did 
whenever there was a miracle that happened? They said, we didn't come here for some miracle. We came to church so we could pick on everything you say. That's what we came here for. We didn't come here for no miracle. What are you doing performing miracles in our midst? Don't you know it's not lawful? Not lawful? Who wrote the law? Hold on just a second. Let's look at this for one more second. It says in the book of Mark, in this same account, in this same understanding, it says, listen to what it says in Mark chapter 3, verse number 6. Once that he restored the man's hand, listen to what it says. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. You know, the Pharisees and the Herodians were actually natural-born enemies. They, they disagreed on almost everything. And here's what happened. They finally agree on something. What do they agree on? Taking down the Son of God. That's what they agreed on. And I'm going to tell you something. Later, we're going to find out they lose. They lose pretty bad in a pretty spectacular way. Here's what goes on. We look at this scene. We look at this moment, and we see that nobody gathered for a miracle. I'm telling you today, I'm not saying that God is going to physically heal some piece or part of your body. What I am saying is this, God is a miracle working God. And when the people of God gather together, we should expect him in our presence. We should not come here just to learn in his word. That's great, that's awesome, that's incredible. You've got his word at your home. You can learn from his word every single day, by the way. You don't have to just come here and expect me to tell you what it says. You can go read it for yourself. In fact, I strongly encourage you to go read it for yourself. The more you read God's word, the better my preaching gets. I promise, if that's just the way it works. And you're like, if you want a better preacher, go read your Bible more. That's as simple as it is. Everybody complaining, well, he's just not a very good preacher. Well, now I know you're not reading your Bible enough. <laughs> what do you think about that? The preacher needs to get better. I think we need to give that preacher, I think we need to send him to a bunch of conferences so he gets better. Let me tell you, you don't have to spend any money doing that. All you have to do is go home and read your Bible. The more you read it, the better it gets on Sunday. It's just the way it is because the more you put it in your heart, the more it's going to bring up things. Whenever I tell you about the synagogue miracles and you're like, oh, you know what? I just read about one of those in my quiet time this week. I saw whenever the woman was crippled and Jesus called her out and when he brought her in, I can't even preach that sermon right now. Go home and read it. Again, it's going to be better. It's going to fill your life more and more. When Jesus shows up, we should expect him to do what only he can do. See, the problem is in this scene, in this scenario, nobody expected Jesus to do the impossible except for the critics and they expected Jesus to do something but it was only to curse him and to destroy him later they didn't come listen and they didn't come just to they the the, the they didn't show up to the synagogue expecting Jesus to heal somebody the the critics realized they surveyed the room and they said okay there's a guy over here that needs some healing hmm what do you think is going to happen so they step back and they begin to watch. Are you a spectator whenever we gather to worship? Or are you a participator in the worship? That's, that's, that's ultimately the question. Are you a spectator? You show up to watch the whole thing unfold and then go home and take your notes and compare them with your spouse and say, this is, man, that was cool. This is a, is this a moment where, <laughs> this is, this, I don't know, it was conviction setting in here. This is, are you the person that says, oh, we're going to compare our notes, you know, uh, Pastor Anthony did this wrong, you know, Pastor Mitch said this the wrong way, and this happened the wrong way, and, and Pastor Gary, who knows what he even did, but he just, he, I just put him on the list. Always put Gary on the list. We got, are, are you the person that goes and criticizes all of it? Or are you the person that says, I'm going to show up and expect a miracle? What's a miracle? The Son of God, the one who rose from the dead, has dwell within his people. He sent the Holy Spirit of God. He is dwelling within us. When the Holy Spirit arises in us, it's supernatural. Every time, it is a miracle. It just is. Are you broken? Are you hurting? Have you gone through something difficult this week? I'm telling you, hope is right here. Hope is right in the gathering of believers, in those of us that have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. Hope is right here. What is it that you are looking for when you come to worship? Are you coming to gather to expect God to do things? What would this place look like if when we gathered... We, had, we came with this expectant heart. And I'm talking, listen, some people say, well, Anthony, you just can't, you can't make God do things. No, you can't. But here's the deal. I know this. God is working in our midst. 
It's up to you if you see it or not. Bottom line. Every week, I see God do incredible things in here. You know why? I'm looking for it. I'm expecting it when I show up. When I show up, I'm thinking, God, how are you going to move this morning? And you may say, oh, so you're watching me. No, I'm not. Listen, I was standing out holding a sign this morning. It was so much fun. It was awesome. I got to see all of you who came in on two wheels late, right? I was, I was late to service because I was like, oh, look at this person driving in. I'm not going to mention your name, but I saw you. As, as this is going on, I'm, I'm looking and seeing, God, what's, what are you doing in their life? As I watched you all drive in today, I'm thinking, God, what are you doing in their, in their car, the people sitting in those seats right now, what are you going to do in their life today? Because here's the deal. I'm expecting God to do great things. You know why? Because I've got a God that does great things. I've got a God that does impossible things, things we can't even imagine, things we can't even begin to fathom. He can do them all. Have you, are you going through grief? I'm telling you, I know a God that can take you through the grief. Are you going through some struggle financially? I'm telling you, I know a God who can take you through that struggle. Are you going through some physical issue, some mental issue, some heart issue, some brokenness? I'm telling you, I know a God who can do anything that you think is impossible. He can do it all. And when I come together with other believers who, listen, I've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. you got the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. So when two of us are together, we got more Holy Spirit, Right? And then when three of us are together, we got even more Holy Spirit. When four, five, six, eight, hundred, two hundred of us are gathering together, oh my goodness, how do we not expect great things? This Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. You want to find restoration? It's in me. That's what Jesus says. So today... No matter what you came in here with, what is your withered hand? What is it that you are here saying, I just came to church. I don't want anybody to know what's going on in my life. I don't want anybody to know the struggle I've got. I don't want anybody to know the issue I've got. I don't want anybody to see or know anything inside my heart, inside my life. And the whole time you walked in the door and Jesus pointed you out. I see that withered hand. I see that broken heart. I see that, that struggle that you just went through. I see that grief that you're carrying. I see that guilt that you're carrying. I see that shame that you're carrying. Jesus has pointed you out. And now he's calling you to stand up in front of everybody and say, I want to show how powerful I am. And then Jesus is going to do a miracle in your life. Now, what does that look like today? Some people just go like, oh gosh, he's gonna call me down forward. I'm not Jesus, okay? I'm not bringing anybody down front. I'm not doing it. Here's what I do know though. Jesus knows everything you're going through. Whether you came in here to criticize, whether you came in here to learn, or whether you showed up expectant, looking for a miracle. I serve a miracle working God. And he is way too good and way too loving to leave you the way you are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what stress is on you. I don't know what burden is on you. I don't know what's withered up your hand. I don't know what it is, but you know. You got a feeling in your heart right now. I'm really struggling with this relationship. I'm struggling with this financial thing. I'm struggling with this job thing. I'm struggling with this issue over here. I'm struggling with this physical thing. I'm struggling with this. my so-and-so's in the hospital. I've got this. I've got this weight, this burden. I've got too much of this, too much of this, too much of this. And Jesus is saying, let me restore you. Let me, let me give you a new hand. Let me restore that situation that you think is bringing you down. And Jesus says this, no, no, no. That situation isn't bringing you down. That situation is bringing you closer to me. And when you get closer to me, you're going to find restoration. When this man, I, I wish, I wish this story continued on and told us what happened to this man next. I personally believe if I'm this man... Now, this is, why this, this is why I'm not this man. If I was this man, I'm walking out and high-fiving all the Pharisees. What is up? Let's go. Let's go. Brand new hand right here. I'm going to try it out today. We're going to worship today with this brand new hand. I cannot imagine the man left with a frown on his face, right? I can't imagine the man walked out without some joy in his heart. 
Anytime Jesus healed somebody, if it ever told us what they did as they left, they were leaping most of the time. They were dancing. They were celebrating. Can you imagine if you're hurt right now, if your hang-up right now, if your depression right now, if your struggle right now, if your hurt and issue, whatever it is you're dealing with right now, can you imagine if that right now was completely restored? You are not walking out of here in a bad mood. You're just not. You're walking out of here saying, my, my chains have been broken. I have been set free. Why? How? What happened? I wasn't even expecting a miracle this morning. I just showed up because I'm supposed to be there. I just showed up because I was scheduled to to be at the door and wave at somebody. I was scheduled to be here to stand in the parking lot to do this. I I just showed up because I was supposed to and Jesus restored me. That's the kind of God that I serve. That's the kind of God that I worship. That's the kind of God that, that's, that's him. That's who he is. As we see, there's all kinds of places in the scripture where Jesus says, look back at what they said about me in the Old Testament. They said he would heal the blind. He would heal the sick. He would do these things. And here Jesus is doing these things. You would think somebody, surely, a Pharisee or a scribe, someone that, that literally memorized the Old Testament saw all of the signs that pointed to Jesus. There was a point, even at one point, where the the Pharisees had gathered together and said, what are we going to do with this guy? He's performing all these signs that we heard about. (laughs) Well, if he's doing that, what do you say we just believe him, (laughs) right? He's restoring brokenness. That's the good news of who Jesus is. I don't know what you came in here with today, but I'll tell you this, I know a God powerful enough to restore it to fix it, to bring it back to life, and to give you hope, a future, a a life that is full and abundant. That's the God that I serve. And I listen, and I'm not even to Easter yet. You know what I'm saying? This is going to get better. Like next week we're going to talk about what happened really in this, after this scene takes place. But today I want to ask you, it doesn't matter what you came in here for because nobody showed up to a synagogue for a miracle anyway. So you say, well, if I didn't show up expecting, how is God going to even do anything? Because he's God, and he's just, he's, he's bigger than your expectations. Okay, here's, here's what I've learned. If I, if I show up with big expectations, here's what I say to God. Now, God, these are big expectations. And he's like, you think those are big expectations? You think that, you think you got me. You think you got me figured out, right? You, you, you're, you're basing, okay, so you're basing all of your knowledge on yesterday's mercies. You know, I got brand new ones today dummy (laughs) let me tell you there's so much more about me you don't even know yet there's so much more man this God is way too good for us to just show up and just sit around hear his word proclaimed sing praises to him and then walk out and our lives be the same he's just too good he's I've, I've determined he's just too good so if that's your story today if you're like I'm just gonna come in do my thing show up Walk on out. Nothing's going to be different. Nothing's going to be changed. Then I would would venture to say, you didn't see Jesus do anything. You just didn't. Because whenever he works, when he moves, and it may be subtle. It may be, and and here's the other, the, the difficulty about the church gathering, right? We're together. God may have just freed somebody today. Maybe you just laid it down and said, God, this is all yours. Here's the problem. We walk right back to our seat and we don't say anything to anybody. (laughs) Let me tell you something. We want to hear it. Tell somebody in the body. Tell somebody else in the church. Let them know, God freed me from this. And then there's praise that breaks out. There's testimony then about who God is because it's God breaking you free. It's not you breaking you free. I thought about all this stuff in Venezuela, these boxes of blessings. I look back at the numbers that Miss Raquel had sent us and I thought, how in the world did this happen? Like I was writing these things down. I was like, you're telling me in each of these years there were, I mean, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, tons, a literal tons of food sent from this little country church in Loudoun. I thought, that's not possible. And God was like, you're right, it's not. Unless you put me in, then it is possible. And I'm like, he's exactly right. Listen, you, we can do incredible things far beyond what our imagination has in store. We can do incredible things through him who gives us the strength. We can do all things through him who gives us strength. This is the proof of it. The box of blessing was a proof of it. We just did things, this church did things that you cannot do. 
I'm telling you, I, I've looked at, you can't do what just happened. You can't give thousands upon thousands upon thousands of gospel presentations at another place in the world when you haven't even been there. You can't do it. How did it happen? God did it. That's how it happened. He connected people. He brought resources together. He showed up in ways that were mighty and powerful and incredible. He did it all. So when we gather together, we testify to that. And then we worship this God who just showed up. That's what happens when you come to worship. I'm asking you to come with high expectations. High expectations. Today, as we close up, I want you to think about where you are and who you are and why you are the way you are. How's that sound? Think about, we are gathered together today. We are a people. No matter if you're here to learn, to criticize, to expect a miracle, to whatever you're here for, just to be faithful because you're here. Maybe, that's, maybe you're just here because you're numb and it's Sunday morning your car drove here. Maybe your GPS told you this is where you got to go. Turn here. <laughs> turn here. Turn here. Okay, show up here. Yeah, the big gravel parking lot that everybody's mad about because it's not paved. Yeah, that one. Yeah, we're going to show up here. Maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you say, I just can't wait to get here. Maybe you say, I, whatever the reason. We are a people gathered here. You made it. You're here. We're all here together. Now, I ask you, what is the problem? Whatever it is going on in your life, God can restore it. I've seen him do it. I've watched him do it. I've experienced it myself. And when he does move, if you were on the critical side, and the critic side in the beginning, if you say, I'm going to come and just judge all this because I don't really trust this Jesus thing. I don't really trust this whole church thing. I don't really trust any of this. So I'm going to be a critic. I'm going to tell you everything wrong with it. If that's you, understand, Jesus does show up, but even when he does show up, you're mad about it. That's no way to live. Why are you even showing up? <laughs> I don't understand. If you're like, well, if Jesus shows up and starts healing a bunch of people, if he starts, if he starts setting people free from their sins, oh, you better believe I'm going to send some emails. That's today's, that's today's Pharisee. It is. It's today's Pharisee. You can see my inbox. It's awesome. I haven't gotten anyone been here. It's been great. It's been wonderful. But I, it's so funny to me. That you will sit and be bitter and be miserable. Jesus shows up. And when he does, miraculous things happen. You cannot set yourself free of anything. He's the one that does it. So today, where you are, what needs to happen in your life to be freed from? What, what do you need to be freed from? What do you need God to show up and intervene in? What do you need God to do in your life? Because here's the deal. He does things. He just, he works, he moves. You may say, well, Anthony, you don't understand. I'm way too much in this problem. I'm way too deep in this relationship. I'm way too deep in this debt. I'm way too deep in this. I'm way too deep in this. I can't get out of this. I've sinned way too much for this. I'm telling you something. It's not impossible with this God. It's just not. So today, as we close, I'm going to ask Pastor Mitch to come up and lead us in an invitation song. This invitation moment is for us to say, I want to respond to what God has just said to me. This is not what Pastor Anthony has said. I'm not, listen, if I say it, if it's from me, it's not worth it, okay? It's got to be from the Lord. But today, I want you to think, this moment is a moment where if you've got a burden, if you've got a withered hand, right? If you've got something in your life that is broken, this is the moment where Jesus says, come right down here. Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not laying hands on anybody today. None of that's happening. Here's what's going on. This is you saying, I am willing to make a move so that God can be glorified. That's it. Pray with me, if you will. Heavenly Father, in this place, we are your people gathered together. Lord, as I see Jesus and the miracles that he performed, God, there's so many things to unpack here. When he performed miracles that weren't even asked for, it was to put the body together. God, in that, I, I, I preach weeks on that. Lord, you put the body together without anyone asking for it. Because the truth is, the bodies were just living with it. The man with the withered hand was just going about his life with a withered hand. Most of the time, Father, in the church, I don't think we realize the parts of the body that are broken and that are messed up. Malchus just lost his ear. Thought, I guess I'll figure this out. And you said, no, no, I want the body to be whole. The crippled woman, the man with 
Lord, as, as all of these scenes have taken place, you have shown us you care about the body functioning together as one and working properly. So God, I pray that we would take that to heart. And today, maybe we've shown up just going about our merry way, thinking this is just the way it's got to be. Father, let us expect the power, the supernatural, incredible power of God Almighty to be with us in this place. Lord, if any of us here don't have a relationship with you, I pray that we would get that settled today. That someone would come and talk to me or one of the other pastors on staff after the service and say, how can I get in this relationship with this Jesus? It's just admitting we can't get to God by ourselves. We can't do it. We can't do enough good works. We can't work our way to heaven. We can't work our way to God. Jesus, God's son, had to come to us. Die for our sins. Conquer death, hell, and the grave so that we could just put our faith in him and all of our sins washed away. God, your story of the gospel is so good. It is so good, so good. It's hard to even believe because it's so, so good. Today, Father, may we respond. May we bring our withered hand to you. May we bring our brokenness to you today. May we honor you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Stand with us this morning as we close our service. Y'all be blessed. Joining us online today, we hope you enjoyed the worship experience. If you want to get connected to our church family, the easiest way to do that is to text the word welcome to the number on the screen. That will put you into our text messaging service, which you will be able to get information about our church family and ways you can connect. If at any point during the message today, you felt a stirring or a prompting that you had questions and wanna know more information, you can also, after you are a part of our text messaging service, you can just text that number and ask anything and it will come to our pastors. We can pray with you if you have a prayer request or whatever you may need. We invite you to come and join us in person. We would love to meet you face to face and see how we can serve your family within this community.